as most of us know by now, the recent 2016 local government elections issued a huge blow to the African National Congress, who for most of or all of the last 20 years of democracy have completely dominated electoral support through all elections, very rarely getting below 60% in any of the elections since 1994. However, in this case, we saw the national support for the African National Congress declining to just below 54% which now puts it in grasp if it loses further support uh, by 2019 national and local government, uh, national and provincial elections, that it could actually lose power. This was not expected, although most polls did show that the African National Congress would decline in support. I think some of the big shocks really were that it lost three additional metropolitan uh, areas, those of Nelson Mandela Bay, Johannesburg and Schwane, because it did not get an outright majority there the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, was able to go into coalitions with the economic freedom fighters, uh, thereby being able to appoint the mayor and effectively rule these metropolitan areas, uh, which were previously under control of the African National Congress. Um, I'm going mean, to be talking largely about local government elections, but it is important to note that the declining support for the African National Congress recently was felt not only in the metropolitan areas, but across the country in, both, in all provinces except KwaZulu-Natal. In fact, the only province where support remained relatively stable was KwaZulu-Natal, but we saw big decreases in a number of other provinces that were formerly really under the control of the ANC. For example, in Gauteng, in the last local government elections, the ANC got 60%, it's now achieved 46%. So if we were to have seen provincial elections being held, they could potentially lost governing the province to a coalition of other parties. Uh, areas where the ANC is largely very strong, such as the Free State, they fell by 10% from 71 to 61%. Limpopo, we saw a reduction of 13% from 82 to 68. Mpumalanga fell 8%. In the Northwest, a staggering 16% declining voter support in these most ele recent elections. So the question is, why has this happened? And what does this mean for the ANC and therefore the country? Now, it is important to note that this decline didn't start in these elections. In fact, the ANC saw growing support from 1994 when nationally, in the national elections there, it got 62%. Up until 2004, it almost achieved 70% of the national vote. When it comes to local government elections in 1996, the ANC got 58%. And as of 2006, it managed to increase its majority to 64.8%. However, the decline then was quite clear from 2009, uh, both in the national elections and the 2011 local government elections, we saw the beginnings of this decline. So what is behind it? I would argue that at the end of the day, or well, the fundamental root cause is that there has been deterioration in public trust in the African National Congress to transform society and to take the country into the future. And that the key root behind this public or decline in public trust is the issue of ethical leadership. Simply put, because of high-level corruption, because of the scandals of all around the President Jacob Zuma and those loyal to him, we have seen a growing lack of trust, uh, a sense that they are not leading the country in the right direction, and that has translated into performing, uh, in many important ways, de uh, deteriorating decline in service delivery and in the management uh, and governance of state enterprises. So it starts with people but not being able to believe what the president or the ruling elite say to them. Uh, this was not uh, unknown when Jacob Zuma was appointed or elected as president in the National Con Conference of the ANC in Polokwane in 2007, that he was facing 783 criminal charges of corruption, fraud, money laundering, and racketeering was well known that he had been subject to a rape trial because of having sexual intercourse with the daughter of a comrade who had since passed away, and this daughter was less than half his age, was well known. However, uh, at that time, most people thought that this was possibly all about political victimization, that there was a big fight between President Zuma and the faction supporting him, and President Thabo Mbeki, uh, who was the president at the time, that he was really just being unfairly targeted and many of these charges were trumped up, despite 
the acting national director of public prosecutions, Mukhtarian Chair, when he withdrew the charges, now we know that was an irrational decision, he said that the evidence that was before the National Prosecuting Authority of widespread systemic corruption committed by Jacob Zuma uh, over a number of years to the tune of over 4 million rand, which led to these over 700 charges, was strong and that the reason he was withdrawing the charges not, was not because of the strength of the evidence of corruption, but rather, largely due to the perceptions of manipulation uh, of the prosecution. Now we know that since Jacob Zuma became president, the scandals did not go away and questions about his ethical ability to hold the post of president have continued to grow. Uh, we have seen massive spending of state money diverted away from the poor to his private homestead in Kandla, good friends of his landing in Vatikloof military airbase for a wedding, breaking all kinds of laws and regulations around our national security and sovereignty. Uh, the same family raking in hundreds of millions of rands from various uh, allegedly irregular deals with state enterprises, such as ESCOM, uh, uh, railway networks, um, deals with SABC, and, uh, and a range of other companies. Um, and that we have now more recently come to see a state capture as very senior people, no lesser than the Deputy Minister of Finance, publicly coming forward and saying that they were offered positions by this family and in one case, Fakie Mengter, an ANC member, said this happened in the presence uh, or while Jacob Zuma was in the next room. And then of course, that these positions of ministers would be given to them if they would then use their political positions to send government business towards the Gupta family. So those allegations are well documented. Uh, and then more recently, we've seen the constitutional court saying that President Zuma did not uphold his oath of office uh, in which case, in which most countries would see the resignation or at least the firing or impeachment of that person. Because if the Constitutional Court finds that you swore an oath that you do know and that you do not uphold that oath, of course, at what point can you start trusting such people? And increasingly, veterans of the African National Congress are speaking out about the lack of trust, the lack of leadership, and the ethical dimension around that. Um, the reason why the president, Jacob Zuma, is able to stay in the, in the African National Congress. He has not been recalled as ANC president or president of the country, despite growing calls for him to do so. And opinion surveys showing most adult South Africans believe that he should step down is because of the way that power is exercised within the National Executive Committee of the ANC. A cursory glance of the names of the National Executive Committee, of which there are 86 people, show that up to around 60 to 70 percent of them we have been given positions as ministers, deputy ministers, chairs of portfolio committees, um, where the ANC president, Jacob Zuma, has potentially either direct appointment ability or sway, means that a lot of a large proportion of that national executive committee, the only structure that can hold him accountable, are directly uh, tied to his beneficiaries, uh, uh, largesse, in terms of giving jobs and positions in cabinet. Jacob Zuma has shuffled cabinet repeatedly, causing a lot of uncertainty and chaos. And so people tend to want to defer to him. And that has enabled uh, him to not be held accountable for the many and growing scandals that have hurt the ANC in the minds of the public uh, as, as the organization to follow or to lead South Africa moving forward. Now, of course, that has also filtered into Parliament. So we saw the Constitutional Court also finding Parliament to have failed in its constitutional duty to hold the executive to account because the ANC used this majority to protect Jacob Zuma from impeachment as opposed to hold him accountable for the scandals uh, if affecting his, oath of, his office and the ANC. It hasn't stopped only with the ANC though. Because of its dominance, because of uh, its uh, uh, prevalence and hegemony across the public sector, we have started to see deterioration in various uh, areas of government. Because rather than having clear ethical leadership that everybody can rally around and implement, for example, the National Development Plan, we've got uh, infighting, which is very clear at the moment. We've seen a war on between Treasury, who's trying to investigate ir allegedly irregular deals by ESCOM and others with uh, companies linked to the Guptas. Uh, we've seen, for example, the deterioration in public safety, evidenced by increases in murder and robberies over the last few years, as people at the top of the criminal justice system, such as Anwar Dramat of the Hawks, uh, uh, the head of the Independent Police Investigative Directorate and others being forced out, typically and often unlawfully, mm -hmm. by police, 
uh, allegedly because they were investigating corruption close to the president. And of course, that is one of the big questions that currently faces South Africans. Why are there, is there such a focus on Praveen Gordon, for example, Minister of Finance, on what many legal commentators argue are spurious grounds? There's been no public evidence, at least, of any prima facie crime that's been committed, yet very hard clear evidence of crimes being committed by people close to the president, seemingly not being given the same level of priority, even though they might be far more damaging to the country in relation to the diversion of public resources involving hundreds of millions of rands involving corruption. While those cases seemingly not being given the same attention and priority as the case against the finance minister. So those questions obviously feed into public trust uh, and or mistrust in this case of the government. Um, and then, of course, uh, the war that's going on between these different agencies really further breaks down people's ability to trust the actual government themselves. And we've seen policy incoherence as the different ministers, of which there are a very large bloated cabinet fight between each other uh, for various reasons, simply, sometimes simply because there isn't clear direction, uh, there is not a clear focus on making sure the aspects of the National Development Plan are further developed and implemented. And, for example, you'll have policy coherence around some of the key areas affecting the economy. So, we are now in a situation where it is clear public trust has declined both in the ANC and surveys show government because of this. So, what, where do we go to from here? Well, we know that in December 2017, if not before, the African National Congress will be hosting its uh, national elective conference. Now, a lot of what's been happening recently appears to be related to that. So, in order to maintain a patronage network and have influence and be able to access monetary, monetary flows, uh, it, the kinds of changes that are needed to root out corruption and bad management in the South African Airways, in the South African Broadcasting Corporation, um, irregular deals allegedly in ESCOM, in Transnet, and other places, the kind of uh, leadership required to change the heads of those organizations and put in men and women of high integrity to run those boards has not taken place. And so, not only are we facing uh, economic downgrades, according to international rating agencies, but government is war with, with itself. And that seems to be because of this national conference, where you will have various factions competing for control. Very shortly um, after the recent debacle around the announcement that the Hawks wanted Gordon to present himself uh, for a warning statement, which those of us who understand criminal procedure know, I mean, this case, without him having facing any charges, seems quite irregular. Um, was the, very quickly the ANC Youth League uh, coming out and saying that they wanted an early elective or early conference, elective conference. So this conference being brought further forward, but that uh, it shouldn't be elective, that behind closed doors, the elite should decide who take over the leadership of the top six of the ANC and the 80 strong National Executive Committee. Um, we've had uh, Gwede Mantashi saying, possibly for different reasons, that maybe it's not a bad idea to have a new elective conference. And we've seen Kassar to, I mean, the South African Communist Party coming out and saying that arguments for having a, an elective conference earlier is factionism and will further divide the party. Certainly given the seeming warfare within the party at the moment, any conference that is held shortly could see uh, uh, further divisions. And this, these divisions are coming out of the decline in the NC's electoral performance. So the ability to dispense patronage, control the organization, uh, is becoming more and more desperate amongst the different factions fighting for it. Typically, these are seen as two key groups. One are sometimes referred to as reformers, people who are not interested as much in corruption. We do believe that the ANC needs to become a modern, urban-based political party in line with South Africa's migration trends to the cities to be able to provide the kind of ethical and coherent leadership to transform the countries and solve its ills or its challenges related to inequality and unemployment and poverty, versus uh, a different group that are more traditional in nature, more backward looking in terms of relying on the struggle credentials to maintain authority, but they're not really having a clear vision for the future, largely wanting to hold onto power for power's sake and all the accesses to, access to state resources that it provides. Uh, that is probably a simplistic uh, view. I think the factions are far more complex and fluid as you move uh, to different aspects or parts of the organization at local, national, provincial levels. But certainly, uh, the electoral conference will have to deal with these matters. 
Now, either the ANC will go into electoral conference in December next year when it happens deeply divided around two different key candidates and slates. In other words, there'll be a group that are loyal to Jacob Zuma and his preferred successor, somebody who could hopefully, in his mind, help prevent him from appearing in court for to face the charges of corruption uh, and to prevent further investigation into the many allegations of corruption that circulate around him and his supporters, versus another faction that might be, for example, coalescing around Deputy President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, and that you'll have a highly divisive and competitive conference in which one slate will take all. And if the slate happens to be in support of President Zuma, we should see uh, further breakaways from the ANC before the 2019 elections, and uh, possibly resulting um, in massive political instability and the ANC potentially losing some provinces, if not national power, to coalition as early as 2019. Alternatively, we'll reach a stalemate in which neither side or neither faction can get what it wants and a compromise will be made whereby possibly President Zuma will be allowed to retire and resign with the knowledge that he won't be pursued for what he's done wrong in office if it comes to light. But that uh, reformers will be given certain posts at the top of the organization to try and bring the ANC back into line with the kinds of values and ideas that people have for so long been voting for it. Whether what which group wins or not, uh, we, we, we don't know, we cannot speculate at this time, but certainly there is a stalemate and within the ANC itself, that top national executive committee is tilted in favor of Jacob Zuma because of the patronage and the networks and access to resources that he has provided. So we're going to probably be entering into a period of political instability moving forward. Um, and it's difficult to know exactly what will happen. But certainly, this is not a good space for the ANC. Its alliances is weakening. Uh, public trust is weakening. And the only way it can really rejuvenate itself is if it does have complete leadership renewal in the next elective conference, and that the men and women that it elects to lead it going forward are people of high integrity and who can be trusted to bring South Africans together in a common vision of solving our most pressing problems. Uh, and so all of us as South Africans, of course, certainly hope that is the case. Well, I think the answer to that can be seen that it hasn't just happened for the first time. We saw the ANC losing Cape Town and then the Western Cape um, into successive elections. So, there you saw the opposition party, particularly which is now the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, learning how to do coalition government, taking uh, over control of Cape Town and then the Western Cape through coalitions, managing those coalitions successfully so that they're able to then um, take over the majority vote in both areas. So I think the dynamic for the official opposition isn't completely new. They've had some experience in running coalitions successfully. I think the big challenge we have here is the, that the coalition is with a particularly unpredictable party or a party that has an ideology that is diametrically opposite to that of the, the, the official opposition, the EFF. Um, so whereas the, the DA has been quite successful in bringing much smaller parties together um, and governing cities and provinces when they are, uh, in fact, follow, you know, use their dominance to ensure that there's stability, um, they're not in a formal coalition with the EFF. The EFF has simply said they'll vote with them in terms of appointing the mayor, but that every issue, other issue thereafter still has to be voted on. So that could be the budget, that could be on key capital expenditure projects, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, and that is a lot of money. Um, in, up until 2000, August 2016, the ANC controlled 99% of the local government budget in Kharteng. Now controls less than half. Um, it's around 40% or less. With the coalition governments controlling um, substantial part of that budget in Johannesburg. The, the single largest budget is in Johannesburg and Chwani making up, uh, along with um, Mkhala City, making up quite a bit of more, you know, the total budget. So in, instability there will have much more of an impact. Um, so we don't know if uh, that kind of arrangement will work. Some people have argued that it's incredibly unstable, that running a minority government where you're not in a formal official coalition around every aspect uh, slows down service delivery decision making um, and can hold and cause paralysis in government. So there's people arguing that. Um, other people argue that the consequence actually is that everybody has to be far more circumspect because the spoilers are more easy to be identified. 
um, and that we're only three years away or less than three years away from the next provincial and national government elections. So any, so it will uh, encourage the ANC to dampen its attempts at potentially making these government uh, local areas ungovernable. Threats around that have been made by certain people in the ANC already. Um, and you already saw, for example, the Johannesburg ANC handing over power in a relatively um, responsible manner. Uh, there were some you know, attempts at trying to destabilize the voting processes in Tuane and Nelson Mandela Bay. But I think as we move forward, uh, those parties that want to be seen as spoilers would also realize that voters might hold that against them and they might further lose votes in 2019. So the argument is that because of that looming election, which is for much bigger spoils, provincial and national budgets, um, that that would force the parties to actually cooperate more than they might otherwise be doing. So you might actually even find the DA and the ANC, for example, in Twani or, or, or the EFF, um, working together, voting collectively on certain aspects, and the EFF may be trying to distinguish itself by voting against. Um, whether that happens or not, we have to yet see. So those are the two scenarios about what coalition governments will mean in South Africa moving forward. But I think that the way our local and national elections are staggered, in many ways it allows the country to get used to shifts and coalitions. Um, it might be far more difficult to have provincial coalitions or a national coalition down the line if you haven't had attempts at these and experience at these at a local level. So because the, the local government provides that expertise and relationship building by the time it might need to happen. I mean, Gauteng as a province, Eastern Cape as a province, or even nationally, even as early as 2019, the, the way of, of, of experience in working in these kind of partnerships and knowing how to manage them has already been ta really taken place. So um, I think that's one of the good things about the way our sort of political system is structured over time. If it, suddenly meant that in 2019 there was a sudden shift, you might find it far more unstable and far more difficult to, to get going than, than the fact that this is a slow process. Uh, it's a fluid environment and every day brings new surprises and new statements from different parts of the ANC, which is clearly struggling as it disintegrates between different groups supporting what are broadly termed as reformists and the traditionalists. Um, so I'm sure this will not be the last time we're talking about South African politics. Um, we might be experiencing some big events in the, in the coming weeks. Already over the weekend, we've seen one of the major national newspapers coming out and saying that there are plans to arrest the Minister of Finance within two weeks, which will cause a dramatic uh, impact on our economy and possibly um, uh, uh, could, it could be a moment of overreach um, on the side that, of those that are against the, the Minister in the ANC. But we will have to wait and see. Um, it is certainly a good time for newspapers and for people who are interested in political intrigue. 